So in this video we're going to look at cellular respiration and all of its glory, especially when we get to aerobic respiration, which is when you really do need to pay attention because it can get a bit complicated there. So what is cellular respiration? It is the breaking down of glucose and this releases energy uh, that is then stored in ATP molecules. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which we looked at when we did photosynthesis. So just a basic little representation of that. This is not accurate. This is just to show you how this works. So when we have adenosine and three phosphates, between one of the phosphates and adenosine, there's a lot of energy packed into that bond. So when we need that energy, that bond is broken and that will then turn it into adenosine diphosphate. Di, two, and then that third uh, phosphate just tags along until it can finally be joined again with the others. And then during this process, oxygen is necessary and then carbon dioxide and water are released as waste products. So photosynthesis and cellular respiration kind of walk hand in hand because the products of the one will then be used as the requirements of the other. So let's quickly look at this. Photosynthesis was an anabolic, is an anabolic process. Okay, so what that means is it's a building up process. And then cellular respiration is a catabolic process, a breaking down process. So with photosynthesis, the building up happened with glucose, when glucose was produced. And then now with cellular respiration, it will be a catabolic process because glucose will now be broken down. So your body is made up of organs and then those organs are made up of tissues and those tissues are made up of cells. This you learned in grade 10. So now for these cells to perform their function daily, they perform work and a function and therefore they require energy. And this energy is for cell division, digestion, movement, transport of substances in the body, growth, active transport against concentration gradients, such as we looked at um, now with digestion in the previous chapter. So the, the cells require energy for all of this. And this energy is produced through the process of cellular respiration. Now looking at the, the equations for this uh, process, this is photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide, water in the presence of radiant energy and chlorophyll, and then some enzymes. Uh, we produced or the plants produced rather glucose which is sugar C6H12O6 and oxygen. Now the reason I'm showing you this is because when we look at the reaction for cellular respiration it is basically photosynthesis reaction just flipped on its side. So Cellular respiration will start out with glucose, so C6H12O6 and oxygen, and then with the help of enzymes, it is broken down into carbon dioxide, water, and energy in the form of ATP. So at the end of this, there should be around 38 ATPs produced. Uh, we'll look at that a bit later on. So just with regards to this amount of ATPs, there's still a lot of um, research being done with exactly how many ATPs are released, but it's anything from 30 to 38 that are eventually released with cellular respiration. Just a, quickly, a quick look at the enzymes that are involved with this one as well. The enzymes that we all will be looking at is NAD and FAD. And then they will act as the taxis, the hydrogen carriers. Remember the taxis from photosynthesis? So they will be attaching to hydrogen and taking those hydrogens across to the other phases. Okay, so we'll get to look at those enzymes a bit later on as well. Now, where does cellular respiration occur? So if we look at this animal cell, if you recall from grade 10, this is what an animal cell looks like. And there's quite a few structures that sh should look familiar, such as the vacuole. You've got the nucleus with the nucleolus, the endoplastic uh, reticulum, endoplasmic, sorry, endoplasmic reticulum, 
with the ribosome scattered all through it. And then uh, the structure that we are interested in is the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. So the mitochondria in and around it is where cellular respiration will take place. Now you also need to be able to draw a mitochondria. So this is a very basic representation of this, a very quick and easy draw. The only two things that are missing here is uh, the ribosome. So scattered throughout um, the endoplasmic reticulum, you'll have these ribosomes. So you can just label those in. And then these structures sticking out, which are the crista. Okay, so these almost look like stalagmites going out, are known as the crista. A nice little 3D rendering of a mitochondria here on the right, um, with the double membrane that is clearly visible, the crista, then the matrix on the inside, that dark green, so the matrix would be in between all the ribosomes here, and then something that you do not need to know yet but is quite interesting for next year is the mitochondrial dna it's these little blue structures you can see uh, inside the mitochondria there um, also known as uh, empty dna which is a quite uh, it, it makes for an interesting topic to talk about so cellular respiration occurs as aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration so breaking down these words so if we split it there it will say aero you know like the chocolate with all of the bubbles meaning air so aerobic respiration it requires oxygen it requires air the next one anaerobic you can split the word there and there so an means not or no and then aero, we know, means air, so no air. So this uh, type of respiration does not require oxygen. There is no oxygen needed for it to take place. Carrying on the similarities between aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, both of them will use glucose, both of them will produce carbon dioxide, and in both processes, energy is released it's just at different amounts of energy are released in these two processes. Now the differences, so aerobic respiration it occurs in the presence of oxygen, anaerobic in the absence. Aerobic respiration, the products there are carbon dioxide and water. And with anaerobic respiration in animals it is lactic acid. And then in plants and yeast cells, it would be carbon dioxide and ethanol, which is alcohol. Aerobic respiration, there's a large amount of energy released because glucose is completely broken down. And then with anaerobic respiration, it is very little energy that is released because glucose is not fully broken down. It's only partially broken down. Then aerobic respiration occurs in two areas, in the cytosol and then on the inside of the mitochondria, whereas anaerobic takes place um, in the cytosol. So what are these two areas that we are just, just uh, looked at now? So outside the mitochondrion is the cytoplasm, and that area is known as the cytosol. So going back to this diagram, all around the immediate area um, of the mitochondrion, all around it, that would be the cytoplasm and that specific area there is known as the cytosol just outside it and then the rest occur inside the mitochondrion so that is as much theory as you need to know so now we are getting into a bit more of a well more of a complicated processes so this is where you really do need to pay attention now so this now brings us to the process of aerobic respiration. Respiration that happens in the presence of oxygen. So there are three stages of this respiration. Now the first one is glycolysis, then it is the Krebs cycle, and then lastly the oxidative phosphorylation phase. So in these three phases, not all of them take place in the presence of oxygen. So for example, glycolysis um, is anaerobic, so it does not need oxygen.
but both the Krebs, Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation are both aerobic, so that means that they need oxygen uh, in order for them to take place. So let's just also look at the different areas in which this, uh, these three stages take place or phases. So glycolysis takes place in the cytosol, so that area outside the mitochondrion and this, uh, in the cytoplasm. Then the Krebs cycle takes place inside the mitochondrion. And then lastly, oxidative phosphorylation um, takes place uh, in the, f the folded membrane, so in the, the crista, around the crista, those folded membranes, that is where oxidative phosphorylation takes place. Okay, so let's get into this and we'll first start with glycolysis because that is the first phase or the first stage. And just looking at what this means, so glyco means glucose or sugar and then lysis means to break up so this is where we are physically going to split the glucose we are going to break it up here so glucose we know is c6 h12 o6 and the reason i'm writing this down is because of that c6 that means that glucose has six carbons now this is not what glucose really looks like I just want you to have a visual representation of the six carbons. And the reason I'm showing you this is because glucose is now going to be split in half. And we are going to produce a three carbon molecule on this side. And then on the other side, there'll also be a three carbon molecule. Now, in order for this to have occurred, there was energy that was used. So energy used. Energy used. And that energy was in the form of two ATPs. Now I'm going to be uh, keeping track of how many ATPs are used and how many are produced and how many hydrogens are used because all of these in the end will mean that there's either energy formed or energy lost. So in this case, we now have minus two ATPs because we've lost that during the split. Now these three carbons actually form something called pyruvic acid. So whatever is going to happen on this side will happen on this side because we now have identical um, carbons on each side. Now with this three carbon structure, in order for it to become pyruvic acid, in that process we um, have now actually produced two ATPs um, on this side and then two ATPs also on this side were produced from going from just the plain three carbon structure to the pyruvic acid. So in total, we have now produced two plus two, which is four ATPs, which gives us a net total of two ATPs. That is what we are left with at the end of glycolysis because this is technically the end of glycolysis. But with those two ATPs that were now produced, we actually released, hydrogen was also released. And if you remember a bit earlier, hydrogen cannot just travel by itself, so it needs to attach to an enzyme. And in this case, the enzyme that we will use is NAD. So NAD comes and it attaches to that hydrogen and it becomes NADH. Same with this one on this side, becomes NADH. Now what this NADH is going to do is it's going to go directly to the third phase, which is oxidative phosphorylation, and it's going to take those hydrogens there. So for now, we don't need to worry about those hydrogens, hydrogens anymore. All we need to know is how many of them have gone and it is one on this side and one on that side which gives me two NADHs that have been produced. So this means we can now go into the second phase which is the Krebs cycle. Now with this I'm only going to be working on the left hand side because Remember, whatever happens here will happen here as well. And it's just going to be a 
big mess if I draw on both sides because there's going to be a lot going on. So whatever I do here, you know to take it over to that side as well. So now this pyruvic acid, which is a three carbon molecule, is going to go into the Krebs cycle. And when it does this, when it goes into the Krebs cycle, it is going to release a carbon. Okay, and then it will be a two carbon molecule that will actually be entering the Krebs cycle. And don't worry, I'm going to break all of this down with you in the end so that you uh, know, well, that you'll know exactly what you need to know and that, for example, this is just me explaining what is happening so you can understand it a bit better. So with this now, we have released a carbon or pyruvic acid has released a carbon. Now the form in which carbon is released from our bodies is through carbon dioxide. So that carbon leaves the body as a carbon dioxide. And with this release of a carbon, a hydrogen was also released. And we know that hydrogen is carried as NADH. Okay, so there's one on this side, and then there'll also be a um, hydrogen released on this side, also carried as NADH to oxidative phosphorylation phase, and there'll also have been a, a carbon leaving this side. So now we've got this two carbon structure ending, entering the Krebs cycle. So what is a cycle? It's going to continue round and around, and this is how it's going to go and happen the whole time. So with the Krebs cycle, it ends over here, just before this two carbon comes in. It ends over here, and it starts um, over here, for example. So when it ends, it ends as a four carbon molecule, the molecules that have gone in there. And this is once again a very, very simplified explanation of what happens in here. If you do go further with your studies in the life sciences, you'll see that there's way more to this cycle than what we are doing. So it ends with a four carbon structure. And here it doesn't start with a two carbon structure. It actually starts with a six carbon structure. So how do we go from four to six, well, that is easy um, mathematics. So four plus two will give me six. But how do I go from six to four? That means somewhere I would have had to lose two carbons. And that is exactly what has happened. So in the Krebs cycle around here somewhere, we actually lose two carbons. And that is in the form of carbon dioxide. And because we've now lost two carbons, we will also lose four hydrogens and a ATP is also uh, produced here. So one ATP is produced. So how are these hydrogens carried? If you thought of NADH, that would be correct, but three of them are carried as NADH. So here we have three NADHs, okay, and then we have one left, and that one hydrogen is a lower energy hydrogen, and that is carried by that other guy known as FADH. That's a two, FADH2. So this is high energy, and this is a lower energy hydrogen, but both of them are important. So these um, hydrogens are now also going to be transported to the next phase which is oxidative phosphorylation so whatever has happened on this side will also have to happen here so that means there's also three NADHs one FADH and then one ATP produced here as well as two carbon dioxides that have been released in this cycle so now we get to go to the last phase which is oxidative phosphorylation now this is where these hydrogens have been gone, uh, been going, and these hydrogens actually carry energy. They're going to help us produce energy, and there's a specific thing that you need to understand here. So we know what an ATP is; it carries energy. But how do we extract the energy from FADH and NADH? So NADH 
1 NADH is equal to 3 ATPs. And 1 FADH, because it is a lower energy carrier, is equal to 2 ATPs. So here, at each of these steps where we have produced um, in glycolysis 2 ATPs and then 2 NADHs, and in the Krebs cycle, we um, have had, well, it's going to basically come down to this one is going to be 6. If I take into account what has happened on this side, there's going to be 2 of those, and then there's going to be 2 FADHs, and then there's going to be 2 ATPs, one on this side and one ATP on this side that was produced. So that is in the end what we are going to look at. Now, let's see what happens. So oxidative phosphorylation is basically just a staircase of energy transfer. So at the base of these staircases, let me rather do it on this side. So at the base of these staircases, you've got something known as a hydrogen acceptor. Okay, so there will be a hydrogen acceptor here and a hydrogen acceptor there as well. So when we look at this, so NADH, all those NADHs we looked at will come into this staircase. And as the hydrogens are accepted, energy is released. And that energy is used to combine a ADP and that phosphate to make an ATP. And now we know that NADH is equal to 3 ATP, so it's going to drop it three times each time releasing a energy in the form of ATP. Because that energy is going to be used to combine ADP and that phosphate to produce an ATP. Now at the last step, is going to be a hydrogen acceptor, but in this case, the hydrogen acceptor will be an oxygen. So that oxygen will actually bind with the hydrogen and it's going to produce water. But now it's a balanced chemical equation. So there's actually going to be two of these hydrogens that are going to bond with that oxygen and that is then going to result in two of those water molecules. Okay, so that's the basics of it, that the water is also released in oxidative phosphorylation. So NADH, as all the NADHs have done that, FADH, which only releases two ATPs, will just come um, in a step later. And it will do the exact same thing. I'm going to use a color, a different color here. So going to drop down these steps, release an uh, energy, drop down, release an energy. So that's the basics of it there. Now, breaking it down, what do you need to know? If we go back up to glycolysis. So glycolysis is the breaking down of glucose, and in the, it's an anaerobic phase, and it happens in the cytosol. And then here, uh, glucose, which is, which is a six-carbon structure, is broken down um, into a three-carbon structure, which is pyruvic acid. And with this, a hydrogen is released as well as some ATPs. Then going into the Krebs cycle, what you need to know here it is that it is aerobic and it happens inside the mitochondrion. And here we've got hydrogen and carbon dioxide that release that are released in this phase and then you also have an ATP that also goes out. Then in oxidative phosphorylation, it's aerobic, it happens in the inner folded membranes of the mitochondria known as the crista and here energy rich atoms, hydrogen atoms from the Krebs cycle are carried here to the hydrogen uh, transfer system by the coenzymes NADH and FADH and here um, energy is then converted or energy is then released when ADP and the phosphate are basically uh, combined because of the energy carrier, um, sorry, the energy that binds the ADP and the phosphate producing ATP. 
And then in the end there, um, water is also produced. So it looks complicated, but if you just go sit with your notes a bit and you just go through these different steps, it should not be too complicated. If you remember earlier in the video, I said that in the end, um, we should have around 38 ATPs that were produced during uh, cellular respiration. So let's see if this was true. Let's go count all of these um, ATPs. So at glycolysis, there were two ATPs and two NADHs. So let's go down and let's write it here. So two ATPs. So this was in glycolysis. Two ATPs, two NADH. Then in the Krebs cycle, remember here we're going to have to count both sides. So in the Krebs cycle, I already wrote it down. Let's count all of the NADHs together. So there were two, so one and one. So it's two, three, and three is six. So that gives me eight NADHs and two FADH, one and one, and one ATP and one ATP. We also need to count these ATPs even though they're already ATPs. So that would be eight, two, and two. So eight NADH and 2 FADH and 2 ATPs. So those were all then carried into this phase. So let's quickly count all of them together. So 2 plus 2 ATPs would be 4. I'm just going to write it like that. Plus, now let's count all of the NADHs. There's 2 there and 8 here, so that gives me 10 NADH. Now, if you remember earlier, I said 1 NADH equals 3 NADHs. So that means we actually have 30 ATPs here. So we can write 30. And then FADH, how many are there? There's two of them. And from earlier as well, 1 FADH equals 2 ATPs. So that would be 4 ATPs. So we write it there. Now 4 plus 30 is 34 plus 4 more is 38 ATPs produced at the end. So we are done there. Now once again, you don't really um, need to know that there's 38 produced and so forth. It's just so that you can understand the concept better of uh, what happens to these hydrogens and the enzymes that are carrying them around. So if you do not understand this yet, don't worry. We still have time in class. This is basically just a little recap video so that you can go watch it before exam if you can't remember what happens where exactly. So now we are done with aerobic respiration, which brings us to anaerobic respiration. And in this, glucose is partially broken down and less energy is released. So you need to know that less energy is released with anaerobic respiration. And there's two types here. So there's anaerobic respiration in muscles, which happens in mammals, which is lactic acid fermentation. And then you've got anaerobic respiration that happens in plants, specifically yeast cells uh, that are known as alcohol fermentation as well. So anaerobic respiration, I'm sure most of you have experienced this, especially during extreme exercise when your muscles do not receive enough oxygen. They start respiring anaerobically, so that means only glycolysis takes place. Um, you don't go into uh, the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. So only glycolysis takes place because that is the anaerobic stage um, of ana uh, aerobic respiration. So here pyruvic acid is converted into lactic acid. And lactic acid leads to muscle stiffness and pain, which I'm sure all of you have experienced. And oxygen is needed to convert this lactic acid back to pyruvic acid so that that pyruvic acid can then go into the Krebs cycle and respire aerobically. So you can do this by breathing deeply and actually... Uh, exercising more so that you have a larger capacity 
for oxygen in your body. So there is anaerobic respiration in muscles, also known as lactic acid fermentation. Then anaerobic respiration in plants, uh, also known as alcohol fermentation. So here, once again, only glycolysis occurs, glucose is broken down, pyruvic acid is formed, but only a small amount of energy is released. So pyruvic acid is broken down further, and then carbon dioxide is released, and then alcohol or ethanol is formed. And examples of this, um, of anaerobic respiration in the industry, of what it produces is um, yeast cells and fungi are used to produce alcoholic beverages such as beer and wine. This is the wine fermentation process. And then bacteria are used to produce yogurt, cheese, and then sour milk. So this, all of these are the products of alcohol fermentation. And that is the end of this video on cellular respiration. Go study hard. And please do not feel overwhelmed with aerobic respiration. Just ask and you will be helped in class.